I got started in the knife making with the interest of uh, making carving knives. I, a good friend of mine, Ken Mankel out in Cannesburg, I got to know him through going down for coffee. I met him and we struck, happened that we just hit the nail on the head to each other, uh, fishing. We like fishing and hunting and we got to be pretty close that way and so then I started mentioning about that I like to come over and try making a carving knife one time. So yeah, go ahead. So I had straight razors and found out they're okay, but they're brittle and they break easy. So I got away from that. And then the next thing I knew I was over at, they had a Thursday night knife making class that they would put on each uh, Thursday of the month. And they would uh, let you just come in and use his equipment, pound out a knife blank and start going from there. And then he was in the business of selling forges and selling uh, other equipment too, but mostly the forge was his big business for the knife makers. So he made a lot of money selling forges over the years. He's out of it now. He sold it to another fella. Uh, so anyway, my first knife, my first knife was this one here. And it's, uh, I always tell everybody it's made out of a 57 Chevrolet. <laughs> it's a coil spring that was just laying there in the barn and I just cut off a chunk and started pounding it. And uh, when, we, when you start out, uh, the, the pounding, you start out with a, a blank of steel. That, that's a coil spring, and then you got to get it flat. So, uh, but that's how I started out on this particular one. Now, when we make a knife now, most knife makers will make them out of blade stock or spring steel. It's for blades. It's a 1084 series of steel. It's spring steel, but it's in your leaf spring of your car, boat trailers, anything like that. That's what they are. So I can just pass that around and they can go, go through the audience there. And that's what they, uh, most knife makers are making them out of that. And uh, you start out with your blank, the size that you want. You kind of judge what knife you want to make. Uh, if you're going to make a, a Skinner, you're going to make a, a Tang type handle, or you're going to make a, 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 full, a full blade and then have the uh, slabs on the side with the rivets. So you have to make those decisions way in advance. So what I do is I, I like to make out drawings and I carve usually a, a knife blade, kind of what I want, out of wood to give me a guide that I can match the steel to as I'm pounding on it and shaping it. So anyway, uh, the next step that I go to is uh, usually most people will start out with the, the, uh, the point, making the kind of point that you want. And it's a matter of taking your uh, your you're, you're, you got to remember everything's hot and I got tongs these these I would be using and then you would on your anvil which is a lot bigger than this little one here but I just made up one here today uh, that you, you start pounding uh, on your point to get your point and you, you got to keep working it because it wants to flare out you got to keep turning you're, you you want to hit even on all sides all the time you try to get a rhythm of, of hitting the the anvil and the blade uh, so that you don't put a bow in it. You can put a memory to the steel. So as, you, as you're shaping it, you're stretching it too. So you're, you don't need to have like that knife that's passed around, like that blank there. That could be a pretty long knife when you get done with it because it's gonna start to stretch and what they call draw it out. And you're gonna you'll be forging it and you're gonna be pushing it. It's gonna start to move and it, they will wanna always start to curl a little bit on you as you're forging it. Anyway, you get it down to the, the shape that you want. Like this one here now, I think I designed this one to be a Skinner. And I'd just take some of this here, would be ground down to get a, a sharper point up here, or you can put a clip on it. And uh, it's just a matter of pounding it down and getting that shape and keeping it straight. You're always holding your, your blades in your, uh, your tongs, you always, yeah, I like to have a white, something light colored that I can look at like that to see that it's nice and straight. So I'm always holding it up towards my motor or camper, it's which is white, so I can use that as a help during the summer months. Anyway, you keep it straight and you keep pounding. And I like to do is you try to pack that edge. When you get down to where you're pretty happy with what you, what you have, then you wanna, I'll try to pack that edge down and keep turning it and I'll pack it down and just keep working that edge and try to pack that steel in as tight
tight as I can to give it a nice solid for a, when you harden it in the temper, you know, for the edge. Uh, good, keep a good sharp edge on it. Then the next thing I'll do is after I get that part done, I, I'm going to make this one will probably end up being a, a tang handle, which would be like this. And you can see, oh, here's your clip, and then you got your tang out here. And you can actually take this and pound that down. You have to take a mark out here where you want to be uh, for this, where the guard's going to go, and give yourself a little extra because got to remember, I'm a novice at this, just like you are. some of you are novice carvers. I'm a novice at this. I've only been doing it for maybe 10 years or something like that, eight years. Anyway, uh, but I'll make a, a draw a line across here with a square, square up where I want to be, and then I'll pound this tang out. And, and this tang would actually be all this steel here has to be squished down and then stretched out. It could be way out here. This one here, I haven't made up my mind yet on it. I'd probably owe make it a tang and I just get rid of the steel. It's not, it's not that costly so I can get rid of it if I have to. But I'll just take and start pounding down on it and you, you just start working it on your, on your anvil, pounding it down. You always have your tongs, of course, hanging onto it. But you'll be pounding that down and just keep working it down and it'll, it'll actually draw itself. And the, uh, the best drawing one is this one. You, you just, you have your I'll use these small ones, they're a little easier. You would be, well, that one's not going to clamp up on it. You've got to have a lot of tongs, too. <laughs> anyway, you start pounding on it, and you can pound, and you're putting little dents in it. And then you do that, and you can flatten it out, and all those little dents then will make it start to pull and draw it back. And that's how you, because this, this one here would, would have started out about that big. And then you drew all this back for your tank. So that's how you get to that stage. And then after you get this, uh, like this one here, you, know, you get it to the point where you're happy with whatever you want on it. Then now I'll put in this bevel crease where I want to have the bevel go here uh, on your blade. And you, I can, this, this one here is rounded too much, but on my other end, well, my home, uh, I can put it right on the side and I can hit right down on it and make that mark right into that. Or I can actually take another piece of steel and lay it flat, and I can take another piece of, uh, of a hard steel, and I can lay it right on where I want it, and I can just hit it too to mark it so that you stay as close as you can to being even because there's just less filing down the next stage. So after you get all this done, you're pretty well ready to start grinding it down and then I use a, a belt sander and I just put it on and I start grinding the, the uh, steel away to get rid of all the slag stuff and you know, all the little porosity that's in the steel you're gonna have a lot of stuff in there that you gotta get rid of so it's a lot of grind time and you just keep grinding then you you gotta keep in mind you're trying to keep the shape and not grind away too much steel and then you get it to this stage, and this, this here, like this one here, is, uh, that's my grandson. Well, both of these knives that are, these two here are made by, this one is made by uh, Stephen. He's uh, 18. He just graduated from school. He gets his first knife. He's pretty proud of it, and he's making it, so. And then this one here is made by a 13-year-old, Jake, and he's uh, doing real well. He wanted a small knife. You can see the difference. Making knives is like carving. You can make it any size you want any way you want it to look. And they're, do they're both doing a real good job in their tolerances in here, because I use a, uh, you know, uh, um, calipers <laughs> in a digital. So you're getting it in thousands, and trying to keep it true for here to here on the top and the bottom and the center. You want it real nice and straight, because the next stage, after you get your grinding done, is that you've got to be able to put a guard on. So that guard's got to slip down there but it's got to be a nice tight fit. And then there's a shoulder area in there that you go to. So after you've gotten all their, your grinding done, first, before you get to the guard, I would jump ahead of myself, is uh, it requires a lot of honing time and filing time. So I put it in a knife, a blade uh, vise. And I'll start filing 
different files that I like, and I'll just file in that groove for your bevel, whatever design you want. And then, then you can do things later with a, a little grinder. Uh, you put a round, put a little clip in here like this, and that cleans up, because it's a lot easier to sharpen these knives when they're, uh, when they're uh, away from that edge here, so you don't have to worry about hitting that uh, on your uh, stone, on the wheel. So anyway, you sh you're doing your, your filing, and it takes a long time to file all that steel off. You got all this steel to file off. Then you get it all filed off, and you're happy with the thickness. It's running true. It looks good. And then it comes into the time of, of, this, of the uh, honing. But I go through all the whole series of, and I use simple green as a lube. It's one of the best, best ones. And then you just start honing back and forth to get rid of all of the file marks and anything else in there that's not true. So it's a lot of time doing it the way I do it because it's hand, hand done. It's hand forged. And then after I get done with all the grinding, then I'll use different sandpaper grits. And this is like 320, but I'll start out with a 150 and then work my way from there down to get it as glass smooth as I can. And so that's the process of eliminating all of this here uh, grind mark from the file and anything else that you put in there that you don't want there you have to work out and it takes a long long time believe me it, I mean it's compared to carving it's a lot more involved in time no. so that's that's where I get it at that point I want to take that out because it's also a pretty dangerous hobby because when I work with these I always hang something over a blade if, I, if I'm back and forth in the basement or I'll take it out. I normally just take it out because it's uh, something that you could trip real easy and then impel yourself right onto a blade. So, and I think it's been done a couple times. I'm really sure it has been because I know I've ripped a shirt too. So, um, but uh, that's the process of that. And then when you get all this part of the blade done, then I go to the, the, the uh, this here uh, tool here, it clamps right on your blade. And then I, I'll put this in this vise. I usually have wood on these holes here, and I clamp it on my bench. And then I'll have this in here. I can tighten it up and I can just show you. And so then what, and then what I do is I'll take the same different set of files. I have all different kinds of files that I've used. And I'll file this across, and that will keep that true. That clean, and I, I'm only taking off just enough to catch it all. And then I'll groove it also this way, because I want a little bit of a shoulder where the tang meets the guard, so that when I, then I'll clean this all up really well, then I have to make the guard that will slip on it and fit all the way down. You pick your guard that you want to make out of brass, and I, there you can buy knife making brass of, uh, from the eighth to all the way up to three eighths, I believe. I, they may go up to half. If you can find, I'm sure you can find brass any size, but uh, I, I don't really care for brass much higher than three eighths. Uh, so that's the next operation is getting this cleaned up, fitting your guard, and making the guard involves, again, a lot of work because you have to be able to drill a hole in here that's true, so you have to do a lot of scribing. And you, I start out with a drill press and I drill a 16th a hole in a line. I have a scribe line so that the drill bit usually will follow that scribe line and hit dead center. Then I take, I'm using my carving tools that I have, my power carvers, and I use a wheel and I'll, and I'll take a wheel and clean that out straight. And then I have other little carving bits that I can put in there that are steel cutters and they will cut out the rest of the brass. Then it goes into the vise, this, either this vise or this other vise I have, and I'll then take my little files, using these small files, find a blade file here. You can see how thick that is. That's, you know, you're trying to work with that, so it, it's, it's got to have a pretty good hole in here. And then you, you end up filing it by hand until you get it to fit to slide all the way down and be down into like so. 
And then you're keeping in mind you got to keep protecting this all the time. So you have to be real careful on how you uh, handle it as far as touching the steel here. So as you get that made, then you got to be able to seat it down on your tight. And I have a jig that I use and I put it in the vise. In this one, it's standing up. So this is held like so. And I can pound on it with a, uh, I use this actually a, a deep well socket. And I can put that right over the tang. And then I have a dummy guard that I put on top of this one. And then I'll pound that one down so it's protecting, it's not skinning it up. It's got tape on it and that helps seat it. And then after it's seated, it, it's, it's pretty well ready to, to uh, continue working on for the handle part. So uh, after I get the guard made, then you have to make the handle. And the handle would be an antler like so or like this one here. And you have to uh, drill that out and start figuring out your handles. And not every antler wants to be straight like this one. You can see it's, it's, it's uh, got to be cocked. So you got to do a lot of engineering and your handle fitting of whatever handle you're going to plan to use. And so I usually start out with my, my deer antler handle like this one, and I'll, I'll find the best way it feels in my hand for the grip and match that to my grip. And I'm left-handed, so I, a lot of, of course, deer got antlers on both sides, so you got a left and a right. And surprisingly enough, that it makes a difference on which one you grab for your comfort. And so I'll uh, line up my, my deer antler for the handle and get that figured out with a pencil and get it all lined up and start drilling out with a, a small drill with a cordless drill and I'll just drill it out and then when I get it what I'm comfortable with then I take a, a carbide cutter on a long stem one that you use for wood carving and I can hollow that out some more then that will slide right over and fit right down and match up and then you have to you, know, you do your final fitting here and all of that stuff is, has to be fitted before you can put it together. So you get it, the handle built, the guards all built, and you're happy with what you have. And then the next stage that I'd go to would be your, uh, the heat treat or the tempering of the blade itself. And so then I, I'll take and I have a stamp made and I can punch in my stamp and I always punch mine in my, my little stamp, num uh, it's a JD. And I you always stamp on the left side. I'm left-handed. So uh, I'll, I'll usually heat them up and stamp, put my stamp in. And then I'll, if I'm really happy with that turned out, if I don't have to go back and do any cleanup, then I can go ahead and uh, do the heat treat for them and uh, the tempering of it. So I'll uh, harden it first. And, I'll, and I have oil in a large, uh, pan of stainless steel pan and it's uh, transmission oil and then I'll get it hot up to a, a dark cherry and then I'll harden it and I'll quench it in that oil on the on the cutting edge first for a moment and then I'll drop it into the full uh, full submerges of the oil and then uh, then it's pretty hard then after I do that I'll take it out and then I put it in the oven uh, in the house <laughs> my wife doesn't care for uh, it does have a little odor to it I try to clean off as much as I can and uh, you have to draw it back at about 375 for an hour or so and let it cool right down to cold and then after that you can go back and clean it all up again and now your knife blade is finished now you're you can finish honing it some more getting it as best you can and then uh, start figuring on putting on the guard it has to be and when you do the guard, again, you're using this, this vise, and I'll, uh, I'll have the, the, the guard to fit. Once I got it seated for the last time, and I'm happy that it it's doesn't sh have anything showing, uh, then I'll take it and put it in. Can everybody see this vise here? I got a vise, but this is what you need to see, is I'll have it hanging on here so that the guard will be this way. It'll be pushed up against it, and I put a, uh, a little weight right here, and then I can pull it down tight, and then I get it balanced and lined up so it's perfectly st straight, and then I'll heat it up 
with silver solder and a, a nap gas, and I use silver solder, and I'll just get that blade hot enough, and I have my flux on there, and the flux will come up from the bottom up, and then I, if I have any overflow on the top, where it's gonna be uh, too much, I can actually, I make a little um, scribe out of brass that I can clean that bra uh, solder off with, and I try to get rid of much as I can so I don't have to have to fuss with so much later. So, so that blade is silver soldered to the guard. And that's what is important in here. That, that there is a silver solder line around there. You can actually see it. And that's the first thing that knife collectors will look at is that shiny line along there because it's important that if you was to clean a deer and you got blood in there and then the next two days, three days, a week later, you were to hunt another, kill another deer, or whatever you used it on meat, the contaminants could still be there if you didn't have the silver solder to keep it out. So when you wipe your knife off, you know, you, that you're keeping it sterile, I mean, for the next animal, and that's important. So that's uh, part of the reason that most guys like to silver solder them on is for that, and, and it's just kind of a rule of thumb with naked knives is to have them silver soldered to the tank. And uh, some, I guess, some people I've heard just recently are going to J.B. Weld. And I, I've never tried it. I like the old-fashioned way. What did you use for heat? Do you have a forge? Yeah, I have a gas forge. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it was made in Cannesburg at Mankel's uh, blacksmith shop. Yeah. Oh, I, I just told What this fella here taught me, is what I go by. He says, do it at uh, the, the temperature is a dull cherry, red. And I try, and well, one thing is you use a magnet. Once you put a magnet on that cherry red, if it doesn't magnetize, you're good to go. That's how it's hot enough that you can quench for your hardness. And then you got to be able to draw back, you know. Otherwise, it's just, I dropped the blade, believe it. When they told me, he says, now if you drop this blade right now, it will shatter. Believe me, they do. They just go in a little bunch of pieces. So it's real easy to break something. About 375, 380, just stick it in the oven on the rack for an hour. And, uh, and a lot of guys I've heard that they'll even double draw just to be sure if they're nervous about it. They'll do a double draw. I've never done a double draw, but uh, I had a little trouble hardening one time and I think it was that uh, it was the, uh, the air temperature was too cold, and I did, you know, I was uh, wasn't paying attention to the temperature of the day versus the temperature of my oil, so I I bumped it up a little bit. I yeah, just I have that on a timer. The oven goes off in an hour, and then I just leave it in there, and, and so that I know when I open it up a couple hours later, it's usually quite cool. Yeah, I, I question that myself because I, uh, you know, I I always asked him, I said, well, this cherry thing about being red is a little confusing. He says, I just throw a magnet on it. That's the safest way. Working with the knives and the steel, you, you get these bars of steel that are the stock. And I miss, is, it, I can take these lengths of steel, wherever that one went that was floating around here. Yeah, that one there. Uh, this would be in a long a bar. And I can cut them off using the forge rather than saw them off. And I have a hardy hole in the anvil. And I can put this hardy in there, put it in, it goes all the way down to the bottom seat. And then they just, when it's hot, you can just put it on there, hit it with your hammer and cut it. It takes a couple of whacks, but it usually cuts pretty good. And in this one here, I, I did the temper and the heat on this one, and I haven't done it since. I did it one time with good instructions, it worked. <laughs> with the, the cherry and the drawing it back to a straw color and doing all the things that's in the book and then what my friends have told me so uh, and there's in the making handles you don't have to go with the antler handle this is stabilized wood pass that around you can see the price tag on it when it goes by and it's a uh, pretty pricey wood but the beauty of that wood is that it's uh, been injected with a resin and it will never move it's just like having a piece of, of steel so it's really good stuff I have not yet made one with it. I've made them with uh, different, um, you know, with a uh, walnut, burr walnut, and that 
these are all real sharp and I don't really want to pass them around but anybody that wants to come up and look at some of them when I'm up here later we can look at handle them but I just don't want to pass them through the audience you know anyway uh, in uh, there's a different materials you have your spacing material flip that around too <laughs> <laughs> um, like this one here is uh, got the spacer in it so you can put a brass heel plate on and then you got your, you know, your spacers up here that'll help just to decorate it more. Some people like that stuff, you know. I, I really got into the, 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 the antler, the crown with a crown here buffed up. And it really pretty neat stuff. And I like that uh, myself a little bit better. Uh, this knife here happened to be this blade here was made out of, you can see there's a number 10 on it. That's out of Johnny Benson's uh, race car, Valvoline car, Napa, or NASCAR, when he that year he won. Because I know Johnny, and uh, I carved, uh, he gave me a spring out of the Valvoline car. And so I made a few knives out of that spring, coil spring. And this one here is out of uh, the truck, the year he won the championship, out of the 23. And one of these carving knives here is a 23 spring. I made it out of that spring steel. One of these got it stamped on the side. I think this one here, little one here. And uh, the knife making has been a fascinating new career for me, but I, I really feel it's tied to carving as well because you're using your mind and you're using the same tools and, and it's really helped me in carving because I still carve and I think that uh, they go together, especially with wood on the handles. And it's just a theme, you know, you're going, uh, you're, you're working with something you're trying to copy uh, with a decoy, you copy nature. This, you're making a knife that, that's your own. So it's a little, little nicer, you know, because you can create your own knife. You bet. Well, that's about all I have. Unless you got some more questions, I'll try to answer them for you.